Okay, we're going to look at this uh, first part of 2.3. Thermal energy transfer in the hydrosphere. So remember, this is water, the sphere of water. How is energy being transferred? We talked a bit about um, trade winds and, and westerlies uh, earlier. Global winds are primarily responsible for thermal energy transfer in the hydrosphere. So it's the winds that transfer energy, thermal heat. The trade winds move waters at the equator to the west. So this is just a bit of a review to the west. And the reverse, the westerlies move water toward the east, from the west to the east. And you can see the colors here, warm and cool waters. Now what I find interesting about this is you have got warm waters in the Caribbean and it's like a river that brings that warm water all the way up to North Atlantic. So people in Scotland can be on the beach and find coconuts on the beach there, brought all the way from the warm waters in the Caribbean. The polar easterlies move waters to the west from the east to the west and their poles. And the Coriolis effect makes, remember that's the spinning and deflection of all these uh, winds. The Coriolis effect makes the currents in the northern hemisphere turn clockwise and the currents in the southern hemisphere turn counterclockwise. So with the winds come these currents. Continents also deflect water because of their shape. Water's gonna bounce off them. And here's another picture. Convection currents in the water and winds on the surface provide these shallow currents in the convection. The deep water currents are the convection currents caused by different heats in the equator and the poles. So thermal energy is also transferred vertically through the oceans, through convection currents. And density of water decreases when its temperature increases. So warm water tends to rise. Cooler water is more dense and it sinks. And what it's gonna bring with it is a lot of nutrients all the way down. So we can get movement of nutrients in the ocean this way. Okay, so we can graph these with climatic graphs. And here is Canada. I'm gonna look at a few places. I'm just going back to this. I'm gonna look at uh, Victoria, um, prairies, okay, in their climatic graphs. There's Winnipeg, precipitation, okay. This would be the summer months. And here's the temperature high of on average 20 degrees Celsius. So big temperature extreme between the winter, minus 20, and the summer, and also precipitation. Here's Saskatchewan, very similar. It's prairies, big temperature extremes. Edmonton, big temperature extremes. Very few places in the world where the average is for minus 15, to plus 15, a big 30 degree change in temperature. We'll take a look at Victoria, British Columbia. It's by water. What water does is it moderates the temperature. Look, a temperature between three degrees and 16 degrees, only a 13 degree Celsius change in temperature. And an inversion of the water, the rain really comes in those winter months. So the results of these, big temperature changes. Why, why do we have such big temperature changes in the prairies and not on the coast? It's got to do with something called the specific heat capacity. Every substance is part of particular thermal properties, one of which is the amount of energy the substance can absorb before it changes temperature. Heat capacity of a substance is a symbol C, is the 
and this is an important definition, the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of a gram of substance by one degree Celsius. Specific heat capacity of water is very, very high compared to, say, metals. In other words, it does not take very much energy, joules, to raise one gram of metal by a degree of Celsius. Compared to water, it takes four joules of energy, remember joules for energy, to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So because of that, that means at places like Victorian BC, the temperature doesn't change very much because it's not around a whole bunch of solid ground, it's near water instead. So high key capacity moderates the temperature. So it's a large number. It takes a lot of energy to raise the temperature of water by one degree. Water also holds much energy once heated. So therefore regions on Earth's surface that have little water tend to heat and cool more rapidly deserts than regions at similar attitudes with lots of waters. So what, deserts get very hot during the day, very cold at night. Okay, there's no water to release the energy, all this energy at nighttime. Capacity of water absorbed thermal energy has a great effect on climate. Substances that make up the lithosphere generally have lower heat capacity, deserts. Victoria is warmer than other parts of Western Canada, prairies, because it's closer to a large body of water, it stores heat. And it's generally more constant. It can absorb heat and re slowly release it. Atlantic Canada, well, minus five to 17. That's a 20 degree change in temperature. Why so much? It's got that inversion again in the, in, the, uh, in the summer months, not as much precipitation, but why is the temperature much extreme, extremer in Newfoundland? Well, let's take a look here. Minus five rather than a plus three is their low. Well, it's got to do, there is Newfoundland. Let's find it on this map, Newfoundland. Look at the currents. Those Labrador currents coming off the Arctic are keeping it very cold and they shoot on down very cold water. Whereas you've got warmer waters going off the North Pacific. You don't have Greenland there. Okay, calculations. Now the calculations we are not going to bother with. We're gonna look at this next week. So instead of doing these, I want you to try doing these questions and add them to the assignment from the previous one. Thank you, goodbye.